speaker is uh, Robert McDermott, University of Wisconsin Medicine, and he will tell us about origin and suppression of 1 over F magnetic flux noise. Okay, so this talk is a little bit of a departure from what we've uh, heard about earlier in the meeting. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, some recent developments in a long-standing problem in materials and device physics that impacts the performance of quantum annealers. So, uh, you know, we know that in an annealer, the idea is to encode some difficult problem in the Hamiltonian of an interacting spin system. And uh, we've heard that it's useful to think of these annealers in terms of the language of spin glasses. We talk about spin glass freezing and replicas and, uh, and that sort of thing. But of course, the annealing elements aren't uh, physical spins. Instead, they're uh, superconducting circuits, which I draw here schematically as little current loops. And we've got control over local fields, and we've got control over interactions. And uh, that allows us to build something useful out of a system of many of these annealing elements. But of course, these little superconducting circuits aren't perfect. And uh, we've heard in a, a couple of the talks uh, up to now uh, that uh, these annealers are uh, also coupled to some environment, to a bath. And uh, kind of the, the funny message that I want to convey to you is that a really important part of this bath is a disordered uh, interacting spin system uh, that uh, creates fluctuations in the bias of these individual annealing elements and uh, makes things work uh, not quite so well. So what I want to tell you about is I'm going to tell you about the history of this problem and uh, give kind of an optimistic message that after uh, 30 years or so, we're really starting to get a handle on this disordered uh, spin glass, uh, physical spin glass that lives on the surface of our annealing elements. And uh, I'm optimistic that in the coming years, we can uh, really make some progress towards uh, suppressing the, the noise that, that comes from these uh, physical spins. Okay, so this work, uh, this is work that I've been doing at Wisconsin for uh, quite a few years, and then over, over that time it's been supported by various uh, agencies, but I really want to acknowledge uh, a gift from Google that's uh, sustained this effort over the last couple of years and allowed us really to push this work through to, I think, a pretty uh, satisfying point, and I'm optimistic about the future. Uh, so at, in my group in Wisconsin, these are the, the big players. Pradeep Kumar is the major contributor over the last several years. But I also want to really highlight the contributions of Claire Yu, a theorist at UC Irvine, not far from here. She's really one of the world's experts in thinking about this problem. And uh, I encourage uh, an, any of you who are interested in learning more to, to contact her. Uh, okay, so here's an outline of the talk. I'll give you a little bit of, of a history of this problem of of uh, flux noise and superconducting devices. And then I'll tell you about the, the evidence that we've accumulated over the last 10 or so years that points to the existence of this uh, interacting spin system on the surfaces of our devices. And then I'll, uh, I'll uh, show some data that we've gotten quite recently uh, that uh, indicates that there's a, a real path towards suppressing this noise and making better uh, devices for annealing and also for uh, gate-based quantum computing. And then I'll wrap up with some uh, discussion of some recent theoretical progress. Okay, so uh, the problem that I'm telling you about has a very long history and it goes back to the 1980s when uh, researchers were interested in taking squids, sensitive detectors of magnetic flux and pushing them to their absolute limits of sensitivity for uh, exotic applications like detecting gravity waves. Uh, so in John Clark's group in Berkeley, what they were doing is for the first time they took these squids and they cooled them down to millikelvin temperatures. And as expected, the white noise level decreased as you reduced the, the Johnson noise and the normal metal components of the devices and got things cold. But there was an excess low frequency part to the uh, flux noise spectrum that scaled with frequency more or less is one over F, and the magnitude of this noise was remarkably robust uh, and uh, very weakly dependent on a wide range of parameters, including geometry, uh, materials that were used to fabricate the devices, only weakly dependent on temperature. 
And uh, this was a, a real puzzle at the time. And there was a lot of work uh, by the Berkeley Group and others that uh, it was aimed at trying to elucidate where this noise was coming from. And at the time, it was, it was not clear uh, at all where the noise was coming from, although a lot of possible noise mechanisms were ruled out. So this was a, a mystery, and it remained a mystery for uh, a couple of decades. And uh, I, I think that it's probably safe to say that interest in the problem kind of waned uh, in the 90s. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, of course, there was a lot of interest in taking superconducting circuits like squids, very much like squids, and using those as elements in a, in a quantum computer. And what was found uh, at that time is that uh, the, uh, the dephasing times oh, were rather short, uh, and some uh, experiments were done that uh, really showed quite clearly that the dephasing was due to uh, low frequency magnetic flux noise with a one over F spectrum. It's the same noise that uh, was seen in, the, in this early work by the, the Berkeley group. And so if you take a qubit and create some superposition state zero plus one, what you find is that the phase coherence is lost on a rather short time scale. And it's, it's possible to show that that's uh, due to this presence of a low frequency flux noise. And uh, another striking thing about these uh, early qubit experiments is that the same levels of flux noise were seen in devices that were very different in geometry, very different in scale. So for example, here I'm showing a, a photograph of a phase qubit that uh, we studied uh, when I was working with uh, John in Santa Barbara. We did some experiments and we backed out a one over F flux noise magnitude of a few microfinaut per root hertz at one hertz. And similar levels of flux noise are seen in, in other types of qubits that were very different, much smaller. For example, this flux qubit from the Delft group. Um, so again, we see that there's this weak dependence of the noise on the geometry of the device, really connects to these earlier uh, experiments from the Berkeley group. And uh, more recently, there have been some very nice experiments by Siddiqui, by the Lincoln group, uh, by the group at Google that show that this noise extends out to very, very high frequencies. It spans uh, 13 orders of magnitude, and uh, the spectrum is very close to 1 over f with, uh, with a magnitude of, in the noise that's really quite uh, weakly dependent on a wide range of parameters. Okay, so where is this noise coming from? What do we know about this? Well, in um, the uh, late 2000s, about uh, eight or so years ago, uh, my group at Wisconsin did an experiment where we took some squid devices and applied a strong local field by intentionally trapping magnetic flux in the thin film of the device. I won't go into the details of how exactly we do this experiment, but the bottom line is we uh, were able to uh, measure a uh, susceptibility of the surface of the device that showed a 1 over T Curie-like divergence as we cooled to low temperature. And uh, of course, when you see this, you immediately think about magnetism, paramagnetism. And uh, I'd be happy to talk in detail about how, how we do the experiments and the analysis. But the bottom line is this uh, data was the first uh, experiment that really pointed to the existence of a high density of magnetic states that live on the surfaces of our devices. And we could do a little bit of analysis and we can back out a surface density of spins. And what it corresponds to is about one Bohr magneton per nanometer, extremely high density of magnetic defects that live on the surfaces. And since this experiment, a number of other groups have probed this surface magnetism in, in different ways. So uh, you know, at this time, we thought, OK, this is great. We know that these spins are there on the surface. And there were a lot of interesting theoretical ideas for how you could get 1 over F noise from the system of interacting spins that live on, on surfaces. And Lev Yaffe and Laura Fauro put forth some nice ideas uh, that uh, invoked spins that interacted via RKKY mechanism. There's some other ideas from John Clark. Um, but still at this time, this is 2008 to 2010 uh, and a little bit beyond, we really didn't know you know, anything about the microscopic nature of these spins. And uh, in the absence of any information about where this magnetism is coming from, it was really difficult to devise ways to try to suppress this noise. And so there's a period of a few years where 
uh, you know, we learned a little bit more about the noise. We saw that there was noise not just in magnetization, but in susceptibility. But we didn't have an idea about how to reduce the noise. And that, that's a problem, because at the end of the day, we all want to make better devices. So we want to understand where the noise is coming from so we can get rid of these uh, moments. OK, so the, the next step forward came a couple of years ago when uh, Dave Pappas at NIST Boulder introduced me to a, a very cool technique called X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, or XMCD. And here the basic idea is you irradiate some sample with X-rays by varying the X-ray energy by irradiating at different X-ray absorption edges. You can get elemental specificity. You can see whether the X-rays are being absorbed by oxygen or aluminum or niobium or whatever. But the other twist here is that you don't use linearly polarized x-rays or unpolarized x-rays. You use circularly polarized x-rays, which couple to magnetism in the sample. So what we do is we do a difference measurement where we irradiate with right and left circularly polarized x-rays, and we immerse the sample in a field. And that allows us to probe magnetism and uh, identify the atom that's associated with the magnetism. And you can do some DFT modeling to, to learn more about the chemical composition of the moments. And what we found, I won't go through this in, in much detail, bottom line is we took films, aluminum and niobium films that had various dielectric encapsulations, uh, the same sort of material stack that we would use to make qubit circuits, and we saw zero evidence of magnetism in any of the samples that we studied until we intentionally degraded the vacuum of the sample cryostat at the uh, end station of the synchrotron. So when you introduce a tiny, tiny bit of air or molecular O2, dry O2, into the sample cryostat, suddenly you see a very strong XMCD signature that uh, happens at the oxygen K edge. And subsequent DFT modeling, density, theory func density functional theory modeling by our collaborators at Irvine uh, shows that this, uh, this signature is coming from molecular O2 that is adsorbed on the surface. OK, so this is really interesting. It's telling us that the films that we're using to fabricate our devices intrinsically aren't magnetic. The magnetism is extrinsic to the sample. And it's suggesting that if we can somehow improve the vacuum environment of the devices that uh, we're making and using for qubit experiments, uh, maybe we can eliminate this noise. OK. Now, it turns out that uh, a fair amount is known about solid molecular O2 at, uh, at low temperature. Turns out it's a total mess. There are a lot of different competing magnetic orders, some long-range magnetic order uh, in, uh, in certain phases. And it's, uh, you know, I think, very uh, reasonable to think that you've got this uh, disordered uh, two-dimensional uh, magnet, sort of a spin glass that lives on the surface of, of your devices. And uh, the goal now is to, to figure out a way to get rid of uh, this, these oxygen moments. And uh, so that's, that's really a, a lot easier said than done. So for uh, really a couple of years, my group has been uh, working to try to uh, beat down this noise, beat down this magnetism. We tried a number of things that I, I won't go into, but the in the end, I think we came up with a solution that is uh, not, not really very cumbersome. It seems to work quite well, and I think it, it offers a good path forward. So what we do is, you know, instead of putting our devices in some sort of aluminum sample box, as everybody in the community normally does, instead we make our sample enclosure out of titanium, grade 5 titanium, which is a great material. It's really hard. It superconducts. It's hard enough so that you can make... Um, all metal uh, vacuum seals, conflat seals. You can bake these enclosures out, achieve really uh, ultra high vacuum conditions, and uh, and it's a you know it's a pretty uh, pretty uh, uh, slick solution and easy to work with, and it's it's not bad at all. So we've done a, a, a couple of different things with these uh, sample cells um, that have uh, allowed us to suppress surface magnetism. On the one hand, we can take our devices, we can put them in this special titanium box, uh, we can bake them for a couple of days to uh, clean them up and outgas them, and then we can backfill in the sample enclosure, 
um, ammonia gas. Now, ammonia, NH3, has a, a higher free energy of adsorption than oxygen, but it's non-magnetic. And so when we do that, when we backfill with 100 torr of ammonia and then seal off this enclosure, what we find is that when we take devices and trap flux and cool them down to low temperature so we can measure the zero frequency susceptibility, we see a much weaker magnetic signature in these ammonia passivated devices. And uh, the, so here we're looking at the Curie response for devices cooled basically with a positive field and a negative field. And the difference here between the red points at lowest temperature, that's directly proportional to the surface density of spins. And with the blue data here, that's our passivated devices, we see that we've suppressed the susceptibility by about an order of magnitude. Now, in any magnetic system, the susceptibility is proportional to the noise, power spectral density, integrated overall frequencies. So this is an indirect measurement of a suppression of flux noise, but uh, it's, uh, it's you know, all the same. It's a, it's a clear indication that we've reduced this noise, uh, the integrated noise, by an order of magnitude. Okay, but this isn't totally satisfying. Of course, we want to measure noise directly. So to do that, what we can do is we can take a squid device, we can bias it with a voltage and use a second squid to read out the fluctuating current through the device, which is going to be proportional to the fluctuating flux in this first device under test. That's just kind of a standard way to measure uh, squid noise. And uh, so we can take a device and, and do that, cool it down to a millikelvin temperatures. And here's some kind of typical baseline data. And what we're doing here is we're measuring the power spectral density of flux in the squid loop as a function of frequency. And uh, we fit this to this functional form here. And what we care about here is this um, prefactor A, the noise power. And also we care about this noise exponent alpha. And so that's what we, uh, we do. We did a series of measurements where we uh, characterized devices before doing any sort of special treatment. And then we took those same devices and then uh, characterized them again after passivating in, uh, in ammonia. Or the other thing that we tried that, that also worked is we've taken the devices, we've irradiated with UV light to promote desorption of strongly bound magnetic species and, uh, and, and done that in UHV environment and then encapsulated. And uh, the bottom line is that both of those approaches work and so we've got before, after spectra of devices that were cooled down without any special treatment and then cooled down in this improved vacuum environment or with ammonia passivation. And we've seen uh, suppressions of noise power spectral density by up to about a factor of five. And so, you know, I can talk to people offline about the details of these measurements and the, and the data. Uh, you know, there's some uh, you know, some, some subtleties or details that I don't have time to get into here. But the bottom line is uh, we found a way, now after 30 years, this is the first experiment that anybody's done to show any sort of reduction in this uh, flux noise power. So this is really exciting. Uh, the reductions maybe aren't as large as we would like, and uh, there's still some work that we can do to optimize the protocol. But uh, you know, I think clearly we're on to something. There's a clear path forward, and I'm really excited about the possibility to, to make uh, better superconducting devices for annealers and, and gate-based qubits. Now, uh, OK, so here's the data that we've got, again, showing the before and after uh, noise power spectral density. And uh, we're seeing clearly for a, a large range of devices and treatments that there's a, a way to reduce the noise. And that's exciting. So in the, the remaining uh, time, I'm, how am I doing on time? You are doing fine. Four minutes. Four minutes. OK, great. I just want to say a few words about some recent uh, developments on the, the theory side. So this is not uh, my work. This is work of uh, collaborators. So uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, Claire Hughes' group has been a real leader in thinking about noise from surface adsorbates. Uh, she's uh, been working over the last couple of years with Rushin Wu, a DFT expert at Irvine. And now that we've got a, a picture of where the, the dominant contributors to flux noise are coming from, you know, what these things are microscopically, we can do some calculations. And we can uh, you know, calculate for a given density of adsorbates 
what sort of interaction energies do we expect to have, what sort of uh, anisotropies do we have, and we can take that data and use that as uh, inputs into a detailed theoretical model that uh, you know, will allow us to you know, get a better handle on what we need to do to, uh, to make better devices. So in uh, Claire, uh, Claire's group, uh, they've, they've looked at uh, uh, exchange energies of O2 adsorbed on an aluminum oxide surface. They see that uh, exchange is dominantly, predominantly ferromagnetic with a very large energy of order Kelvin or more. So that corresponds to a frequency of 20 gigahertz. Uh, and so this, uh, this large energy scale, this is setting the, the high frequency roll off from this 1 over F noise. So this large energy scale, this is why we see this 1 over F noise going out to almost 10 gigahertz. So the, the highest uh, fluctuators, these are the, the guys that are coupled most tightly together with this very strong ferromagnetic exchange. Um, and Claire has done a lot of simulations where she's taken uh, distributions of exchange energies and showed that this is very compatible with a 1 over F uh, magnetization noise spectrum. Uh, now, uh, another uh, development, uh, sorry, it looks like PowerPoint uh, is having some problems here. Uh, but uh, in, in the group of uh, Lev Yaffe working with Laura Faro, uh, they have uh, quite recently started to think very seriously about noise from adsorbed oxygen. And um, one of the key and subtle things about the O2 molecule is it's a spin one object. It's not a spin one half object. When you've got a spin one, that means that there's a possibility for uh, ra random anisotropy. And in uh, the work from Lev and Laura, they've uh, modeled uh, this interacting spin system as having some uh, RKKY interaction, although exchange uh, works just as well here. Uh, and this random anisotropy is a key ingredient because when, when you have that, it means that magnetization is no longer conserved locally. Okay, so previously, Lev, Laura, others have thought about some spin diffusion model, and you can calculate 1 over F spectrum uh, from uh, spins that diffuse with local conservation of magnetization. Uh, and that kind of works, but it doesn't really match up with a lot of the features of the experimental data. Uh, namely, uh, with spin diffusion, you wouldn't expect the noise spectrum to extend out to gigahertz frequencies. If you've got this random anisotropy, then that... Uh, that means magnetization is no longer conserved locally. And uh, the relevant energy scale is actually going to be the bare exchange energy. Another key thing is this random anisotropy means that you can have spin clusters that get stuck in these very high energy configurations where they can't emit energy to their surroundings. And so locally, you're going to have a broken time reversal symmetry. And that's enough to give you correlations in magnetization and susceptibility noise, which we have observed experimentally. And it's really hard to cook up a theoretical model that will give you those correlations. With oxygen and random anisotropy, this is explained in a very natural way. So uh, I'm really excited about the possibility to develop a really detailed theoretical model for this noise. And uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap up. So uh, uh, Hardman started this, conver or this meeting by saying that he's an optimist. I'm also an optimist. This is a really hard problem. It's been around for three decades. But I feel really confident that we've got a great handle on this. We're going to make significant progress in the coming years. The message here is that we now know where 1 over F flux noise is coming from. There's a path forward to reducing this noise and developing a, a really uh, detailed theoretical model for noise from these adsorbed moments. And, uh, at the moment, my group has sort of pivoted, and we're working now to characterize this noise in uh, qubit circuits. And it's a pleasure to work with the, the Google group on this. And I think we're going to make a lot of progress in the coming years. OK, with that, I'll end. Thanks. Question, please. Uh, please. Thanks very much. Th this is just a curiosity, but how do you produce circularly polarized X-rays? This is actually really interesting. Um, so uh, they have magnet arrays that force the electrons in the synchrotron to travel in these uh, helical paths. It's kind of nuts, but that's how they do it. 
Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, did I understand uh, correctly that uh, when you made this treatment, the suppression of uh, the magnetic susceptibility was much stronger than suppression of the noise? That's true. And so one of the subtle points, I'm happy to talk about this in detail, is that the devices that we used to characterize the surface susceptibility were niobium-based. Uh, because we need to be able to trap flux vortices in the films in a controlled way. We've not been able to do that with aluminum. Um, but those niobium devices, for various technical reasons, really weren't amenable to the type of noise measurements that we could do. So we measured susceptibility on one set of devices and noise on another set of devices. So that's correct. And the susceptibility suppression that we saw is larger than the noise suppression that we've seen up to now. And uh, you cannot uh, tell that there is a violation of fluctuation dissipation theorem or something? Um, so, I mean, we haven't done any experiments so far that uh, would allow us to you know, tell whether we're dealing with an equilibrium system that's going to obey fluctuation dissipation or whether we're out of equilibrium. Uh, I mean, this is, this is one of the things that we're interested in looking at moving forward. Uh, more questions, please. Hey, Robert. Oh, I got the mic over here. Uh, really great work. Um, I'm kind of interested. I saw that your post-treatment uh, results had a reduced exponent. And I know that right. dephasing depends on the integral of right. that noise up to, right. say, the megahertz regime. And I don't know if you have any results of kind of taking that integral and seeing if you see a reduction in that area underneath the noise spectrum. You know, so you're absolutely correct. And I... Uh, you know, I don't want to read too much into this data, but you do see in devices where the, uh, the noise magnitude at one hertz is suppressed. We, we do, I think, you, you can sort of squint and maybe you don't have to squint too hard, but it, it does look like there's a suppression in the noise exponent a little bit. So if you're totally pessimistic, you would say that, okay, maybe you've just taken spectral weight and shifted it from low frequency at the high frequency, which would be bad, right? But you think about what's happening physically, and if you, if you have the system of interacting O2 moments, and you start to remove some, so you're reducing the density, then you're gonna do two things. You expect the high frequency cutoff of the one over F spectrum to move to lower frequencies, because you're reducing the maximum exchange energy. At the same time, you're um, preventing the formation of really large clusters, which are gonna dominate the fluctuations at lowest frequency. So what I would expect, and we haven't done the experiments to prove or disprove this is what's going on, but naively what I would expect is that as we reduce the spin density, then the noise exponent and the low frequencies would come down and sort of flatten out the spectrum, and then also that high frequency cutoff would move to lower frequency. And this is exactly the type of thing that we need to look at in detail by doing qubit-based measurements that will allow us to access the frequency spectrum over a really broad range. So, uh, I mean, this is, this is th these are things that we're going to be looking at in the coming uh, months and years. All right, uh, very nice data and, and a, nice, a nice set of theory to back it up. I'm just wondering, you saw a drop in the 1 over F amplitude, but the drop was sort of factors of 2 to 5. Can you comment on, on what do you see? Do you think that there's a, maybe a second spin bath or that you might not be removing all of them that clear? So, I mean, it could be that uh, the remaining noise is due to some residual O2 moments that aren't getting removed, and so we're, we're trying to uh, improve this encapsulation uh, protocol and create better vacuum in these sample cells. Another possibility is it could be that there's a second um, population of spins that don't live on the surface, that are contributing to low frequency flux noise at some lower level. We just don't know at this point. Um, but you know, the fact that we do in certain devices see up to an order of magnitude suppression of susceptibility suggests that you know, this is, is really by far the dominant contributor and um, uh, that's about all we can say at this point. So you showed the data uh, uh, about uh, magnetic susceptibility, um, Curie temperature of uh, like theoretical data. And I noticed uh, that it's about 4.3 Kelvin. Oh, Curie temperature. Curie temperature. Yeah, so yeah, this is from uh, Claire U, correct. That's, 
So if this is a uh, correct Curie temperature, uh, so th those pins will be frozen at, uh, at, at millikelvin, completely will be out of the picture. Um, yeah, but I mean, we're dealing here with a disordered system, so you've got some distribution of exchange energies, and um, more recently, Lev's group has done some more detailed uh, calculations where they take a you know, modest distribution of exchange and they've calculated um, a system of uh, you know, 100 by 100 or so interacting O2 moments. And you very naturally get uh, these arrangements where you have little paramagnetic puddles and ferromagnetic regions. And so, you know, I think you're going to have some uh, noise from maybe domain wall motion, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a disordered system, so you've got a broad distribution of these interaction energies. I see. So, but you are not ruling out that you might have the second path of spins. No, I mean, we, can't that, rule it. we can't rule it out, but I think that this is certainly the dominant contributor. This is like a... Yeah. Trevor's question. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Thank you yeah. very much. I think we can conclude the session and thank the speaker.